When a theory makes a prediction that disagrees with an experimental test, sometimes it means we should throw that theory away. But what if that theory has otherwise produced the most successful predictions in all of physics? Then that little glitch may be pointing the way to layers of physics deeper than we've yet imagined. Well, Fermilab's muon G-2 experiment has been chasing what might be the most promising glitch of all, and they've just announced their results. The standard model of particle physics describes the elementary building blocks of nature with incredible success. At some level, it's right in a very fundamental way, but it's not the whole picture. For one thing, it doesn't explain gravity. In fact, it doesn't play nice with Einstein's entire theory of gravity, which itself is clearly right in its own way. Our search for a theory of everything which will bring these theories together is perhaps the next great quest in physics. To find the path forward, we need to find glitches in these theories, loose threads that might lead us to deeper layers of physics. We don't have many leads. These theories are woven pretty tight. But there is one glitch, one stray thread that is just begging to be tugged. And that's the anomalous magnetic dipole moment of the muon. And the scientists at Fermilab have just tugged it hard with the muon G-2 experiment. Today, we're going to see what's been unraveled and what might lie beneath. But first, what is all this techno babble? What's an anomalous magnetic dipole moment? What is a muon? What is G-2? Let's take them one at a time. We've actually talked about the anomalous magnetic dipole moment before in terms of the electron. That's an episode well worth checking out for a deeper dive, but briefly. Of all the incredible successes of the standard model, this seems the most miraculous. It comes from the part of the standard model that describes how particles with electric charge interact via the electromagnetic force, quantum electrodynamics. One of the interactions that QED describes is how a charged particle will tend to rotate to align with a magnetic field. The strength of that interaction is defined by something called the G factor for the particle. That's the G in our G-2, and we'll come back to that later. QED predicts a value for the electron's G factor that matches experimental measurements to one part in a billion, by far the most accurate prediction in all of physics. If this works so well for electrons, surely it works for other particles too. Well, actually not so much. The muon is a close cousin to the electron, identical in all properties besides its heavier mass. Starting 20 years ago, experimental measurements of the muon G factor did not agree with the QED calculation. And that's not because QED is just wrong, rather it tells us that the calculations have missed something, and that something may be physics beyond the standard model. Let's start by talking about quantum spin. We're actually going to do a deep dive into this topic soon, so today we'll just cover what we need to get by. Every particle with electric charge also has quantum spin. This isn't the same thing as simple rotation, but particles with quantum spin do generate a magnetic field. Same as if you send an electric charge around a looped wire or have electrical currents in Earth's spinning core. The result is a dipole magnetic field with a north and a south pole. Place an object with such a field inside a second magnetic field and the object will tend to rotate to align with that field. The strength of that rotational pull, or the torque, is defined by the object's dipole moment. For a rotating charge, that depends on the object's rate of rotation or angular momentum, its charge and its mass. Here's the equation for the classical dipole moment for a non-quantum rotating charge. Yes, this will be on the test and it's also useful for the next thing I'm about to say. An electron also has a dipole field and a dipole moment, which depends on the electron's spin, charge and mass. But the electron dipole moment is different from the classical one by this factor g. For the electron, g is around 2. So the electron responds to a magnetic field twice as strongly compared to what you'd expect for an equivalent classical rotating charge. Quantum electrodynamics tells us exactly what this difference is. To understand this, let's look at the QED picture of the world. In this theory, electromagnetic interactions result from charged particles communicating by exchanging virtual photons. In QED, you figure out the strength of an interaction by counting up all the ways that this interaction could occur. For example, a pair of electrons could repel each other by exchanging one virtual photon, or two virtual photons, or three, etc. 
or those virtual photons could do something weird like momentarily becoming an electron-positron pair. We depict these interactions in Feynman diagrams. Each Feynman diagram represents one family of ways that the interaction could proceed, and the sum of all possible Feynman diagrams gives you the interaction strength. For a deeper dive into Feynman diagrams, virtual particles, and quantum electrodynamics, we have you covered episode list in the description. We can represent an electron interacting with a magnetic field with the simplest possible Feynman diagram, really not even a full Feynman diagram. We have an electron being deflected by a single photon from that field. If you calculate the g-factor from just this simplest case, you get a value of exactly two. Paul Dirac first calculated g equals two from his eponymous equation, but there are other ways this interaction can happen. The next simplest is for the electron to emit a virtual photon just prior to absorbing the magnetic field photon and then reabsorbing that virtual photon. Same particles in and same particles out, but a slightly more complicated sequence of events. Adding this interaction allowed Julian Schwinger to calculate a slightly higher value of g equals 2.00011614. Over time, more and more complicated interactions were added. Each layer of complication involved many more Feynman diagrams, but also added less and less to the interaction. The latest calculations rely on powerful computers to add many thousands of Feynman diagrams and get us our g-factor to 12 significant figures and a latest calculated electron g-factor of 2.00011596521816643. By the way, the anomalous in the anomalous magnetic dipole moment refers to that little bit extra after the two. So the g-2 in Fermilab's experiment name refers to that leftover bit. Measure that leftover bit and you're testing the subtlest interactions of the particle. For the electron, the current measurement is precise to one part in a billion, and to that degree, it perfectly agrees with the theoretical number. An obvious next step is to do the same for other particles. The electron is the lightest and most common of the lepton family. It has two heavier cousins, the muon and the tau particle. Muons are nice because they're easily produced in radioactive decay. They live only a few microseconds, but that's long enough to work with them. During their brief existence, they're very similar to electrons. They have the same exact charge, interact with the same forces, and have the same quantum spin. They have a different g-factor because there are slightly different ways that the muon can interact with the quantum fields. So, you add up all of the Feynman diagram for all possible electromagnetic interactions of the muon. But you don't stop there. The quantum vacuum is seething with an incredible variety of possible virtual particles. There can be very subtle interactions that involve the other forces, weak, strong, and even the Higgs field. All of these tweak the muon's g-factor by a tiny degree. And when we include every possibility encompassed by the standard model of particle physics, we get a g-factor that's ever so slightly off the experimental results. So why would we get the wrong value for the muon, but not for the electron? Well, I can tell you what the physicists hope is the reason. The muon is 200 times more massive than the electron. The probability of interaction between a particle and some massive virtual particle is proportional to mass squared. So the muon is 40,000 times more likely to be perturbed in this way. It's 40,000 times more likely than the electron to encounter, say, a virtual Higgs boson, or a virtual proton or other hadron. And it's 40,000 times more likely to encounter any completely unknown virtual particles that might be hiding out there. Accounting for all of the known particles still gives a muon g-factor that's off. So the rising hope is that an as yet unknown particle is at work here. So finally we get to the Fermilab muon g-2 experiment. Prior to this experiment, various labs over the past 20 years have refined the muon g-factor measurement. Until now, it had been measured precisely enough to claim a 3.7 sigma difference compared to theory. That was at Brookhaven National Laboratories in 2001. There's roughly a 1 in 10,000 chance that random fluctuations could lead to that degree of difference just by chance. Physicists, however, prefer a 5 sigma signal before declaring a discovery. For 5 sigma, there's only 1 in 3.5 million chance of random noise resulting in the same signal. The muon G-2 experiment at Fermilab hopes to push closer to this level of confidence and is designed to achieve four times the sensitivity of the Brookhaven experiment. At the Fermilab experiment, physicists send muons flying at nearly the speed of light around a 50-foot diameter magnetic tube. The muons interact with the magnetic field and their own magnetic dipole axes rotate. 
like a top just before it falls. We call this Lamour precession, and its frequency depends on the G factor. The frequency of the precession also governs the energy of the particles that these muons decay into. So, by measuring the energies of those particles, positrons in particular, the researchers can determine the precession rate and so measure the G factor. So, what did they find? Before I get to that, you might remember around five years ago, physicists at the Large Hadron Collider thought they detected a new particle based on a slight bump at a particular energy of the decay products. That was a three point something sigma detection. More data was collected and the bump went away. It really was just a random statistical fluctuation. So, has the muon G factor deviation gone away? No, no it hasn't. The muon G-2 team literally just announced their latest result and the confidence is now at 4.2 sigma. So not yet a slam dunk detection, but definitely moving in the right direction and with more confidence than the LHC bump ever achieved. The chance of randomly getting a 4.2 fluctuation is just a little over 1 in 100,000. The hallowed 5 sigma confidence will take time and many more muons. Unless, of course, this was a systematic error, some unknown factor influencing the measurement that is not a new particle. The G-2 team worked very hard to rule anything like that out, but the only way to be sure is to repeat the measurement with a new, independent experiment. But if all of that goes well, then this may be a faint glimmer of light in the current theoretical wasteland. You can bet that physicists will be chasing down that glimmer with great enthusiasm. In fact, I expect a flurry of theoretical papers in the very near future. Perhaps this time, some of them will be right. So, there you have it. That's how we peer beneath the hood of reality. We scratch our heads and scrawl on chalkboards for about a hundred years, then we build a giant magnet and watch the muons dance. And that dance may just have revealed to us the next step on our path to a more complete understanding of our quantum space-time.